Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me here this afternoon. Uh, it was a privilege to be invited, um, although this was followed by instant realisation I had to compress this topic into 20 minutes, uh, which is slightly daunting because there is an awful lot to talk about. Um, so if you'll forgive me, we're going to work on the assumption that you've all heard of D-Day. <laughs> yes. um, now you might think that to investigate overlord archaeology, you would probably need to go across to France. And the time team went over there 10 or 15 years ago and excavated a German strong point just behind Gold Feet. Um, but actually, there's an awful lot of D-Day archaeology much, much closer to home. And seeing as we're in the Thames, I thought I'd have a look at what's closest to where we are now. We're up here just now. Waterloo Bridge, and if we went down river as far as Erith over there, then we would start to find some interesting things. Now, obviously, there's some familiar sites like Dagenham Carp Lodge on the, the north, and then on the south side, we have um, I forgot the name of it. Cross Ness Sewage Treatment Works. And um, a curious little feature just down in the treatment works this space age building, the Belvedere Sludge Incinerator. <laughs> Very nice, isn't it? But what I particularly find interesting about this is that little pond just in front of it up there that Google had rather quaintly called the River Thames. Um, <laughs> but what's interesting about that little pond is what this site was actually built on. Because about 75 years ago, uh, this was an area um, of basins, little flooded pieces of land just inland from the river itself. And in fact, these are plotted most perfectly in the 1950s Ordnance Survey map. Um, there are about two. There's this one here, and then the Belvedere uh, sludge incinerator is on this one, which isn't particularly well drawn by the Ordnance Survey, unfortunately, but I can assure you it was definitely there because you can see the pair of them just here. And this is 1947. Uh, they are essentially, if you like, uh, primitive dry docks. They, they're just flooded pieces of land. You can see that there's some coffer dams here blocking them. Uh, and you could pump all that water out and then build something uh, and then remove the uh, copper dams across the front, flood it and float it as you build out. Now that landscape has changed significantly with the uh, installation of the Belvedere sludge incinerator. But that little pond just at the front, those depressions left over from the, the basins were there right up until the 1980s. And I'm pretty certain that that pond is the remnants of one of those basins. And the reason I find that interesting is because in 1944, this came out of it. Now, that doesn't look like much. That looks like a rather weird barge. Um, and it is a bit of a rather weird barge. It's actually made of concrete, but it's not finished. And when it is finished, after it's been taken to another dock facility and built up, it would look something a bit more like this. And I think some of you are probably starting to recognize this now. This is a Phoenix caisson. And if you go across to the coast of Aramanche, you will find a lot more of them. This is part of the famed Mulberry Harbour that was taken over to Normandy just after D-Day to provide a harbour facility for the Allies. Now, Mulberry can be quite hard to interpret when you look at it like this, but actually it's a very straightforward port, and we can compare it directly to our own ports like Dover. Dover, you have the simple facilities for the ships, the ferries to come in here and dock, and then around the entire port, you have the breakwater, which provides this area of sheltered water for the ships to come into safely. Mulberry Harbour works in exactly the same way. Here you have the mooring facilities, so the deep water piers are just here with the pontoon roadways leading back into dry land. And then around the outside of that, you have the breakwaters, and these are made from the Phoenix components. Now, most of these Phoenix uh, Caissons were built in dry docks around the country. And here in Southampton, in dock number five, you can see four of them being built all at once. Dry dock is drained, they build them, and then they open the dry dock to pump the water back in, and they can float them out. And they were actually built almost all across the country, uh, as far north as uh, Middlesbrough, Goole, Hull, the uh, Liverpool area, uh, Swansea, and primarily, you'll notice, around the Solent area and then around the Thames. Now in the Thames, uh, there's quite a large number of those construction sites, ranging from the Isle of Dogs right down to Pilbury. And primarily, uh, closest to where we are now, those were using the existing dock facilities of London docks. And they were, such as in this example, Surrey docks, the docks were pumped dry, 
caissons were built and then water was pumped back in and they were floated out as completed units. And the vast majority of the first tranche of building in the uh, January through to June of 1944 were built in this fashion. Um, but they leave very little trace today because, of course, they were using existing facilities. So there was nothing left after they'd finished. And in fact, most of the Docklands, as you are aware, has changed quite considerably. So it's very hard for us to go there and look at archaeological remains of these sites. But in the second tranche of building, they used these basins further along the river. And in fact, they used about half a dozen, maybe eight, that I found referenced in records. But the real problem is trying to then identify where they are. Now, somewhere, somewhere in the National Archives, there's going to be a document that actually gives some grid references for a change. But at the moment, all I've come across is site names. And it's very difficult to find these because they're very ephemeral. And as we've seen from some of the other presentations today, the Thames has changed considerably, even in the last 75 years. The only other basins i found, just north of Tilbury, you can see them just up there, and a little bit closer up there they are again. I think these must be what are referred to on the construction orders as Gray's Basin. Um, and that is literally all I've been able to find. But they do represent just little bits of archaeology. That little pond in front of the sludge incinerator is one of those bits of archaeology of the construction of Mulberry Harbour. It might surprise you, though, that Mulberry Harbour actually leaves us a very rich archaeological legacy, and not just in Britain or off the coast of Normandy. All of these represent remaining relics of Mulberry Harbour in some form or another. Now, you might what on earth are all of these green dots deep into France and what's happening up here in the Netherlands? Well, the Netherlands is easy to explain. After the war, um, there had been a lot of damage to the dikes and Mulberry Harbour components were used to help block those breaks in the dikes to repair and uh, reclaim the land. And the same thing happened again in 1953 after the Great North Sea Storm. We sold a lot of spare phoenixes to the Dutch so that they could put them in breaks in their dikes, and then rebuild the dikes around them, leaving places in the Netherlands that look a bit like this. This was a gap in a dike, blocked up with phoenixes, and then the dike rebuilt around it. And if you ever go to Zeeland in the Netherlands, I urge you to go to the Watersnood Museum, which means the Flood Museum, which is actually housed in these four phoenixes. You go in here, you walk through all four, and you come out the back. It is a fantastic opportunity get really close to Mulberry Harbour. In France, all of those green dots, well, as the Allies advanced through Europe, the Germans had destroyed bridges, they needed replacing. So these whale roadway units that were part of the floating piers fitted the bill perfectly. And you can still drive across these on public roads in France today. But we do have components slightly closer to home, back in the Thames again. If you go down river to a place called Fort Bay or Dungeness, uh, then you will find this Float, uh, not floating, sunk uh, in the water. This is case on C128. It was built at Tilbury, uh, but unfortunately it developed a fault while it was being towed and it was abandoned. And that is one of nine of these Phoenix caissons still to be found in various stages of degradation around the coast of Britain. Uh, the two best preserved ones are these in Portland Harbour. These are actually now listed buildings. Spares, they probably never went to Normandy. They were used as a breakwater. There were 10 in Portland Harbour, and then we sold eight to the Dutch in 1953. So these are the last two uh, perfectly preserved ones in Britain. Um, but there are other elements of Mulberry Harbour that we can investigate, and in particular in the Solent area. As I said, most of those caissons were built in dry docks, but they were also built because there was, just wasn't enough space in dry docks um, on the waterfront. And in fact, engineers chose four locations in the Solent, uh, Leap, on the New Forest coast, Gosport, where there were two sites, and Hailing Island, right over the other side, where they would build these directly on the foreshore. Here you can see one of them under construction with the timber shuttering, the mould to pour the concrete in. And there wasn't just one, they actually built four in a row along the shore at Hailing Islands to construct these. And then they built specially prepared launching ramps to launch the caissons down once they were completed. And if any of you know Langston Harbour, this is the entrance. That's Portsmouth on the other side. There's the ferry terminal up the top there. Uh, and in this manner, these caissons were assembled, moved to the launching ramps, 
and then launched into the water. Now that isn't quite finished. What you've got there is essentially the hull and then the upper works will be completed in Portsmouth docks. At the end of the war, that left a complete construction site on Hailing Island, and you can see elements of it here in 1947. What you can see here are keel blocks. These are the, the concrete <coughs> blocks that they actually constructed these caissons on, and there are the slipways. But that site has changed, uh, unsurprisingly, over the last 75 years. And if we look at it today, we can see that, in fact, there's now a car park there, uh, and all sorts of things going on. What's actually happened is the space between all of those keel blocks has been filled in to provide a level surface for the car park. But there is still an awful lot of concrete to be found there. And just last week, Citizen Southwest team were out surveying this site. And I have shamelessly stolen these pictures off of the Citizen Twitter feed because I couldn't go that week, unfortunately. Uh, but they have been recording all of that exposed archaeology. And here you can see one of the volunteers uh, recording the points of one of those keel blocks, which now serves as a sort of marker for an incredibly wide car parking bay. Um, <laughs> but what's interesting, though, is that that's been infilled. So it's been covered over almost. And What's very interesting is that's happening at the rest of the site as well, as Google shows us. Between 1995, and watch this spit down here, into 2007. It's, that spit is constantly growing and spreading and covering over these launching ramps just here, to the extent that this year there was very, very little to be seen of them. So that's a site that's actually being almost buried as a result of human action in the car park and by coastal action in front of it. Now there are other sites that are slightly easier to see and work on, and over here at Leap, uh, there is a very well-preserved Mulberry construction site. Here are the launch ramps, and they are visible at almost all states of the tide and in very good condition. And in fact, the entire construction site at Leap, a mix of concrete and brick, is very well-preserved and a very easy site to interpret to understand how the construction was actually carried out. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why Citizen 1, the first tranche of Citizen, carried out regular surveys there to record this site in great detail. Uh, and this is when I became involved in volunteering for Citizen and with my work with the New Forest National Park Authority as well. And that's actually me there, uh, before the sun leached my hair. <laughs> <laughs> and this work has allowed us to create incredibly detailed records of these sites, which is very valuable because Despite all of the research that I've done to try and find out more about these, I can tell you an awful lot about the Phoenix caissons that were built here, but we haven't found any plans or any records of the construction of the construction site. So these surveys are our only means of properly recording them. There is no set of plans produced in 1943 that we can turn to instead. And it's important that we do this because unlike Hailing Island, Leap is eroding. And you can see over at the northern end there how much of it has actually been broken up. Now that is actually semi-deliberate. After the great storms of 1987 and 1990, this was being undermined very badly. And two archaeologists, Martin Hughes and one Corinza Lewis, um, took a survey of this site and then Hampshire County Council deliberately broke up this part to turn it into coastal defences. And it's been very successful in that regard. But it is a reminder that this site is being eroded. And over time, uh, hopefully not for some time, but over time it will be lost. Now there is something else at Leap, and it was certainly a very busy site in the Second World War. And you can see it here. This is the construction site, and then here we've got these uh, piers sticking out into the water. And this is an altogether different sort of D-Day site. This is an embarkation hard, or what's left of it. These were purpose-built hards for landing craft to load vehicles and men onto their vessels before they sailed to Normandy. And there's two dolphins from the pier left remaining. Um, if you'll pardon the pun, they are very much on their last legs. And every winter I look at them and think they're not going to survive this year. And every year they do, but this cannot stay the case forever, unfortunately. They will go, which is a shame because these appear to be the only two surviving dolphins from an embarkation hard in the entire country. Now, also you will find a lot of this interesting looking concrete patterning down on the beach. And this is another distinctive feature of these embarkation hards. 
And they were built all around the country. 76 of them were built between 1942 and 1944 in groups at major ports. So five at Falmouth, five at Plymouth, six at Gosport, four at Southampton, uh, where was it? Medway, there were three, Tilbury, there were five, Felixstowe, there were four. Um, and they provided the means for landing crafts to embark troops. Because landing craft, of course, you embark through the bow door. You can't use a regular dock facility to load a landing craft. What you really need is a concrete beach. And that's what these essentially were. You had your concrete approach road and your concrete hard standing above the high water line. And of course, you can't set concrete in the intertidal area because tide comes in and washes it away. So that was solved by a gentleman called Lieutenant Colonel Vassin Steer Webster from the Royal Engineers. He constructed, uh, designed, um, the intertidal beach hardening mat, uh, which is essentially a precast concrete mat. You make lots and lots and lots of these, and then you put them in the intertidal area to provide your hardened beach. And then your landing craft can beach, drop its ramp, and your vehicles can drive down the beach onto the vessel. And these are very effective things, as you can see. Uh, they can easily take the weight of tanks and literally tens of thousands of these were precast so that uh, these embarkation hards could function properly without the, the uh, problems of vehicles bogging down in the shingle. Uh, or, yes, they, they take quite a pound. Um, and this might give you some clue as to why they acquired the nickname chocolate blocks. Although you wouldn't want to bite on it, obviously that would be uh, quite painful. But they, um, they're very distinctive features and we find them at embarkation hards so is that right? There we go. Um, and one of those other sites is at Stokes Bay in Gosport, which is one of the southwestern team's discovery zones for the Citizen Project. And Stokes Bay actually had four of these embarkation hards all side by side. And this is some genuine colour footage of Canadian units embarking in their landing craft at Stokes Bay. Um, Canadians were well served by colour sign film and colour cameras. And these are actually Hobart's Funnies. Armoured Vehicle Royal Engineers, these would be the first units to land on Juno Beach on D-Day, embarking in the land craft. <coughs> Incidentally, uh, the East Riding Yeomanry also embarked here at Stokes Bay, the, the unit that Gustav mentioned previously. Um, so, these sites were well charted by the Admiralty. Here's one of their plans. You can see Embarkation Hub G1, just here, the concrete apron, the beach hardened area, the pier. There's G2. Now, again, this landscape has changed significantly in the last 75 years. Uh, it's now a, a popular place for going to the beach when it's sunny enough, walking the dog. Um, and there's now two car parks there, Alverstoke West and Alverstoke East. But what's very interesting is if you look at where those car parks actually are, and then we go back 75 years ago, they've been built right on top of the concrete aprons of those embarkation huts. And if you park your car there, uh, and walk around to the beachside, you will find the Second World War concrete. They literally just tarmacked over the top of it, so it's still there. And if you walk down into the beach, into the intertidal area, you will find more of those chocolate blocks, and you might find Citizen Project Manager Caroline as well. Uh, she's occasionally down there. Um, now, not all of them survive that well, unfortunately. Many of them are completely gone, such as this one at Dover. Uh, now you can see the embarkation hard there with two piers. Um, also, you will see just down there that house with the, the white balcony. And that might be familiar to you because if you've ever rushed for the ferry at Dover, you've driven past it just there. And that shows you what's happened to that bit of waterfront in Dover. It's moved out several metres, land reclamation. So there is nothing left of that embarkation hard at all, unfortunately. I do do this in my spare time, so I go a little bit beyond Citizen. I go inland, which they're not allowed to do. But there is an awful lot of associated archaeology just inland from these sites as well, because these embarkation hards are all very well, but you needed the facilities to reach them. And huge concrete roads were laid across the countryside to create access routes to these embarkation areas. And some of the charts and plans that you find demonstrate the building program required. Here's Embarkation hard PP1 in Plymouth. Here's the roads that are going to be laid to reach them. Uh, and much of that survives to this day as part of the country park uh, on that bit of coast. 
inland, you will find plans of roads, uh, public roads that would need to be improved so that vehicles and convoys could make their way to the embarkation areas. Each one of these red dots is where engineers have said they would need to put in a passing place, a lay-by for vehicles to pass one another or for broken down vehicles to pull into. And if you go along those roads today, it doesn't take you long to find them in exactly the same place as they're plotted. So is this a, a new feature? Is this a, a new monument class? Is this a D-Day label? <laughs> now, why is this relevant? And what can we learn from it? Well, I think it's important because we can tie this in to the events of D-Day itself. This is a Sherman flail tank of the Westminster Dragoons. It landed on Gold Beach on D-Day and was knocked out by a shell. Um, but we can learn an awful lot from this picture because on its chassis, it has all of the details about its unit. That's its unit identification. Uh, and this is something, a nefarious number called the landing table index number. This decreed which vessel it would go on and at which point in the whole landing process it was due to actually land on the beaches. We can tie that back into the historical record of Force G, the naval force that took the troops to Gold Beach. And we can find that reference number 2026 and match it to the embarkation hard where it embarked on its landing craft. Q2 is the code for leap in the New Forest. We can go back through the war diary for the Westminster Dragoons. We can investigate where they were, where they were marshalled in a camp and sealed before they then went to their landing craft. And in doing so, we can actually plot their journey to the coast, through the New Forest and down to the embarkation hard at leap. And then we can investigate and plot the archaeology that survives along that route. This is all very much part of what archaeology is about. It's about finding evidence for past events and recording what still remains to this day. And in doing so, these concrete labels on the side of the road aren't just bits of archaeology, or sorry, bits of Second World War concrete left lying around. These aren't just bits of disparate concrete on the shore that are eyesores. These are part of a much larger story a narrative that culminates on the beaches of France. And we can do it as well with the Mulberry Harbour phoenixes that we were looking at earlier. The Admiralty and the Royal Engineers kept fastidious records about each one of these. They all had their own code numbers, uh, details of its construction, the quality, the design, when it was going to be towed over to France, and then where it was placed in Mulberry Harbour itself. And we can use all of this documentation to investigate the Mulberry Harbour at Aramosh. If we look at just one bit, the western breakwater, uh, we can use all of that documentation to identify each one of these individual Phoenix caissons. Uh, and there they are, their individual code numbers. We can trace them through the years that follow D-Day uh, into 1950 and then through to the present day when they're starting to look a little bit more dilapidated. And in doing so, we can actually look at each one of these individual remaining pieces of concrete and we can tell you where it came from. We can place these as part of the built heritage of this country rather than just archaeological relics in France. So this one built in the New Forest, these two at Stokes Bay, and those ones across the top, all part of London's contribution to the war effort. Now, you may still think, why do we need to do this? It's all very relatively recent. Is it really archaeology? I think it is, and I think it is important, um, because this year we commemorated the 75th anniversary of D-Day with a very large event in Portsmouth, and in September we commemorated the outbreak, sorry, the 80th anniversary of the outbreak of the Second World War, and we are now into the 80th anniversary period, and right through till uh, 2026, uh, sorry, 2025, we're going to be commemorating events all over again. But with this passage of time, we are very soon going to lose our living links with the events of the Second World War. These pieces of concrete still give us the opportunity to maintain physical links to those events. And where we start to lose our living links, perhaps these can provide us with the opportunity to learn more and to inform new generations and make them understand the events of that war. So I, for one, enjoy looking at this concrete. Um, and I think we can learn an awful lot from it. If any of you uh, think that concrete is up your alley, then follow me on Sea Spitfires and you'll get loads of it. Uh, of course, you can follow the Citizen Project as they are investigating many of these sites and I'm sure some of their fieldwork reports will be up uh, very soon. So, 
Thank you very much.